Welcome to the Greyhawk DJC podcast. In today's podcast, we talk with Angela Marone, owner of the AJ Marone Consulting Agency in Dallas, Texas. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, Angela. Hey, David. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. Thank you for coming. Um, I know we don't really know each other, but uh, thank you for replying and you know coming on the show. Um, so we typically start by getting to know you a little bit. So mm-hmm. if you could tell us about you know where you came from, your family, where you grew up, uh, your background. Sure. Um, you know, let us know more about you. Yeah. yeah. So I've actually been in Texas for ten years now. This okay. month just marks ten years. So I like many of your guests. I'm a transplant to okay. here. So I'm originally from the Northeast, mm-hmm. and I grew up there. So. I did my undergrad work in psychology. And while I was doing that in one of those summers, I worked for a residential treatment facility. And I came to find really quickly that clinical psychology wasn't really for me. So I found that um, really fast, that conclusion. But what I did notice is the company that I worked for at that time, I was really interested in how the organization worked and how the actual people within it functioned. And that to me was pretty fascinating. So it led me to industrial organizational psychology, which is a specialty within psych that really uh, is concerned about organizations and organizational development. So it really led me to a good path in that sense, because it's it's really rewarding for me. Do you get a degree in that? Yes. Okay. So I did my undergrad in psych and then I got my master's degree in IO psychology and I did that in Chicago. Okay. So, and one other thing while I was at that residential treatment facility, it was actually in 2008 and I had opened a 401k cause they offered that and I was like, mm-hmm. wow, this is so cool. And you put money in, they, they match you and everything. And it was growing real nice. And then the end of the summer came and it kind of got obliterated oh, <laughs> with well, everything so with, what happened, with the guess. financial crisis that oh, happened. Wow. So it, um, it wasn't like there was a ton to, be, to begin with in there, but it was my first experience with, wow, um, so what when, happened when you say it got obliter- obli- uh, obliterated, um, what happened to it? I guess. I mean, it shrunk in size, like the value of the 401k to almost nothing. You're yeah. Saying. It was pretty dramatic at the time. Oh my gosh. So, okay. but you know, it was an experience and something you remember <laughs> when you walk away with that. So, right. um, it got me interested too in, in finance a little more, but I was still very focused on my education and everything, mm-hmm. but kind of left a mark that I would revisit at a later time. Sure. Sure. So, so after school, <clears throat> where'd you end up and what's your so background? So while there? I was getting my master's degree, I mm-hmm. started consulting down here for a few different companies okay. and it was focused on organizational change management. So that is a discipline that's within IO psychology mm-hmm. and it's really concerned with managing the people side of change okay. because a lot of times people don't like change, right? So mm-hmm. especially when it deals with the way you perform your job or the way that functions and you really want to be able, the company really wants to be able to maintain a high level of performance whenever we move over, cut over to things or mm-hmm. change the way people do their jobs. So I focused on that kind of work. Okay. And so it brought me down here. So while I was, like I said, while I was in school, I started consulting down here. And then after I finished my master's degree, they offered me a position down here full time. Okay. So I moved down here for work how did you, uh, 10 years ago. How did you get those consulting gigs? Did you so while apply I was, or? Yeah, I was actually doing an internship through mm-hmm. my master's degree and okay. was working with a consulting firm. And then they started working with organizations that were down here. Okay. So it was a really great experience. So when they bring you in, what do they have you do? On like, Tell me what your day-to-day activity is when they, they bring so, you in. Whenever you're looking at change, you kind of have a a whole full process. And depending on when you're coming in, if it's early on with just developing the change or if you're on the back end and it's like, you know, you you really got to just jump right in and and start your strategy quickly. So a lot of times what you want to do is start a needs analysis Mm -hmm. to really get a pulse on what's going on in the project, in the organization. What are the different cultural factors that kind of go into play when it comes to defining what that change needs to look like? So, um, and depending on your stakeholders, you're going to have a different type of outcome. So what kind of leadership you have, if they have their own capacity for change and leading change. So sometimes you're having to build their capacity and coach them so that they can then coach others that they lead to driving that change and making it happen. Are you speaking to them or are you... 
coming up with an evaluation form. Yeah, uh, I'm speaking document. to all levels of stakeholders. So from the end user that it's touching mm-hmm. to the people you know the, that are going to have to be consuming the change to the people that are leading the change and the people in between that are helping to manage. So you've got the managers and individual contributors. So you're kind of having to go through all of those different pieces and factors to pull together the narrative and the story and do a diagnosis of what needs to happen to make a change successful. I see. And what, what types of changes do you run into? Like, So um, some of these changes are the way, like I was saying, the way somebody performs their job. So you might be going from something that um, some of the older technology, it's all um, based on just terminal and keyboard. Right. So you're just going from a keyboard, really quick responses to uh, what we're used to today, which is a, you know, a user interface where you click and point. Mm-hmm. But that can often be very challenging when you've been used to doing it one way for 25 to 30 years. So being able to manage that and take those stakeholders, the end users particularly in to what the change is being developed into Mm -hmm. so that they can give us real time feedback and say, well, no, that's not going to work this way. And here's why, because here's how I need to perform my job and here's how quickly I need to do it. Because uh, the changes that I was focused on was very operational in nature, the people that were doing the job. So Mm -hmm. it's not like they're able to, miss a beat very much whenever the change did occur. So it was really important that we planned all of that ahead of time and that they were fully prepared to uh, consume that change and to be able to to do their job completely differently basically the next day. So is this also the end users managing how they're gonna make that change plus also telling the managers what they need to expect. Right, it's okay. kind of a full feedback loop so that you can get that top down and bottom up kind of feedback because a lot of times it's just top down mm-hmm. and they don't really know how the bottom up works right. or how that needs to function because if the farther you are away from that end user, the less you really know about how things need to work or sure. are in an ideal state. So if you don't so. do this as a company, what happens? If- well, <laughs> You can kind of see what happens whenever you don't handle change well, right? So a lot of times your productivity goes down, you get attrition, people leave because they're just clearly unhappy and and they don't know how to do their job anymore. So they're not comfortable anymore. So um, you see see a lot of that. Do you see a lot of companies saying, well, they're just going to do what we tell them to and what's the big deal? Do you get that pushback ever? Sometimes, but you do see a lot of times where they see the value in change management because as I would say when I started off about 10 or 11 years ago in change management, there was, it wasn't as, um, what's the word? Popular. I don't know if popular or just people weren't aware of that as much. It was kind of just like you were saying, well, they're going to just have to deal with it, right? Mm-hmm. But whenever you can make a case that says, well, here's why you can do it differently and how it's actually going to benefit you as a stakeholder or as a leader, then you're able to start influencing that conversation a little bit more so that you can get a, a more people-friendly change environment, you right. can say. Right. So how long were you at the consulting agency for then? So I consulted with them for about a year and a half until I moved down here full-time mm-hmm. um, working where I do now. But then... After a number of years uh, there, I always had this desire to work for myself. Sure. So in 2017, I started my own consulting on the side, which is really focused on individual development Okay. because I really find value and fulfillment in helping other people grow. Mm-hmm. And it's just genuinely something that makes me really happy. And I know it's something that I can help people with. I'm confident in doing that. So if I can help with their transformational change in whatever capacity they're interested in doing, I'm happy to help them in that way. And what, what was that decision like to start your own company? Um, were you pushed or did something happen or? Well, I wouldn't say something happened per se, but it's always kind of been in the back burner of my mind. And when I first came out of school, I was really focused on all of my debt, (laughs) all of my student loan debt. So really focused on paying that down. So I didn't really want to put myself out there and continue to add more risk when I was just starting out my career uh, full time. Mm -hmm. But whenever... Uh, 2017 came around and I think, you know what, this is really something that I know I can do. Mm -hmm. And my master's degree really prepared me to help learn to become an internal and an external consultant. So it already lended itself to wanting to be your own independent person and becoming a sovereign in that sense. And I really wanted to be able to promote my values that I have. And I felt like 
starting an, a company and doing that was a good outlet to be able to reach people in that way that I couldn't at my my uh, full-time position. Okay. And so, what's the name of your company? It's AJ Marone LLC. Okay. So very um, simple. Mm-hmm. And how did you fund the company? Um, tell us how you got started. Mm-hmm. With, like, how'd you so get clients? Yeah. Whenever I was getting started, I was really mindful about how much everything was going to cost sure. and, and all of that. And because it's just really be party of one, I was able to keep that cost down and try to drive it in a way that um, lent itself just to having having the kinds of um, costs that are just lower in general. So not having a particular like physical office space. If I'm gonna meet with a client, I'm mm-hmm. either gonna meet with them uh, offsite somewhere or through online with a web a webinar, uh, I'm sorry, a WebEx. Okay. So a webinar in that sense and being able to meet with them there. And then having an online website, which I can easily just promote to people and say, here, here's my website. I have an actual storefront and you can kind of see the different services that I provide. Sure. So the initial costs were basically forming the company and then creating the website at first. Mm -hmm. And then how did you go about getting your first set of clients or did you already know folks? Well, I was doing a lot of word of mouth Mm -hmm. at this point because I wanted to make sure I didn't quite overwhelm myself because it was on the side. And so I've been growing it that way and it's been really beneficial to me and um, very fulfilling to do. Yeah. what is your avenue for getting clients now, you say? Is it more word of mouth now? or do you It do is social more media word of mouth at this time. Okay. And then I've recently, so this year I recently started to offer Bitcoin classes okay. because that is something that really embodies my values mm-hmm. and is something that I think is extremely important for people to understand. And okay. it is, it's very misunderstood at this point. And right. I don't think there's a lot of good data and information. I mean, there is out there, but there could be more uh, people that are just educating in the space. Okay, so we'll get yeah. into Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Um, but if, let's say I was someone that called and asked for your services, mm-hmm. what would that process be like? And then when we met, how would that go, I guess? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I would talk to see about what, what kinds of information you were looking for, what kind of growth pattern you were looking for, because mm-hmm. I offer services like coaching and individual coaching and also personality styles development. Okay. So a lot of people have a different personality and they have a set way that they like to do things. And I have a tool that enables you to really see what that personality looks like mm-hmm. and then what your current environment is asking you to do in that environment. So we have different stressors in our environment and depending on what that looks like, sometimes it can drain a person and they don't really see that until they kind of walk through this personality process. Would it be someone that says, um, so I'm not as far ahead in my career as I thought I would be at this time in my life. Can you help me figure out what I may not be leveraging? Or doing yes, right? I could. Okay. we could go through something and say, hey, based on your personality style, here are the kinds of things that you might be able to gravitate to more and mm. really do well with. And then here are the kinds of things that you might struggle with because of your personality style. So if you're a pretty introverted person, for example, you don't like to talk to people or you just have a real close uh, knit type of you know, social circle, mm-hmm. you're not gonna wanna be selling cars. Right. Or, you know, I mean, that's just not your personality to wanna go out and be very sociable and then make that close. So you have to be sociable and want to drive a close. Right, right. So that would just, not that that person can't do it, it's just that it takes them more energy to do it and they might not be happy doing it. So would you, if you did all the evaluation, could one of your recommendations be maybe this is not the best career choice for you and this might help you better? Things right, like and that. Okay. you might lead yourself into a different location okay. right, of sorts. Wow, that sounds very interesting. I, I didn't know this existed, so this is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone were to start their own company and they're thinking about that, what is your advice for them? you think as an entrepreneur I would say really know what your purpose is in starting that company is and Mm -hmm. what are your high-level goals and values that you want to be able to push out okay because if you don't have those things it's a hard to fill in all those details right? right because there's a lot to creating a company and then keeping it going and having the own your own motivation to Mm -hmm. keep driving it because a lot of times it's it's a lot of work and there's not always the reward that matches that right right yeah um a lot of entrepreneurs face barriers with their family um they have responsibilities they can't take that next step or risk 
um, as someone in your profession, how would you tell them how to manage that, you think? Um, because we get that a lot, just interviewing people. Mm. It, it was very difficult at first. They had to really muster the energy to take that risk, right? So mm. any thoughts on how someone could get over that hump, I guess? Well, I would say it takes, you know, a d definitely a lot of inner thought, mm -hmm. you know, like with what your purpose is and looking at your support cir circle as well, because looking at your support that you have around you and how you can leverage your environment can really help you because mm -hmm. there's so many great resources out there today that you can just go to the internet and search how to do X and you can find a million different guides on how to do that and make yourself better. Right. So having a kind of growth mindset is really important. So there's this concept of a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. And we often look at things with that kind of lens of, um, things are fixed, meaning I'm going to hide my mistakes. I'm going to try just to, to stay above water, but you know, I'm, I'm not really going to try to grow myself versus right. someone that looks at mistakes and says, well, I can learn from that and I'm going to challenge myself and I'm going to grow and continue to have that mindset that lets me expand on mm -hmm. things and be open to all kinds of challenges that you might not allow yourself to be doing if you had a fixed mindset. Right. Right. So, so basically it's okay to fail. Right. If you have the mindset to, to if you have that, that growth mindset to Absolutely. do it. And that's one of my values is growth, just growth of the individual and of organizations to be able to grow positively in a way that makes somebody independent and sovereign. Because mm -hmm. if you're not growing, you're usually going backwards or you're staying static in some sense. Right, right. So but for you personally, it wasn't that difficult to know that you wanted to do this on your no, own. No, right? it was not. Okay. So that was always a part of you mm -hmm. for, for a long time. That's, that's very awesome. Yeah. That's and again, with that, my background, it just really made it easy to do that because it was almost expected during my master's that, mm -hmm. you know, you, here's how you get business and here's how you write a proposal and right. here's how you do all of these things. It's like, well, this really isn't, I can do that. Right. You know? right. So where do you see yourself and your company in the next five, 10 years, I guess? So. Teaching Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I mean, that is, it is such a big deal for me. And mm -hmm. um, some of my other values are, peace. So having a peaceful and tranquil environment and mm -hmm. really making things that are harmonious. And that to me is being attacked right now in many different forms and fashions in our environment. So I just feel like that is something that is so important to make sure that we can focus on as a society and for things to be fair. That's right. another Absolutely. one of my other ones is right. fairness is things are things fair? Do they, are they perceived as fair and why? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that. And then my last, um, primary value is liberty is individual liberty and having that paired with accountability. So you can be a free person and have be accountable and it can be okay. Mm -hmm. Just don't p hurt people and don't take their stuff. Right. You know, absolutely. That's kind awesome. of mantra. Um, so in your business, do you see more of the Bitcoin consulting growing or the coaching as far as management going? Well, they're really interrelated. Okay. So while I do see Bitcoin as being a big piece, I would also continue to want to grow people in that way that I was talking about with the personality styles and the coaching. And mm -hmm. those could be threaded together, actually, because oh, wow. okay. um, thinking about Bitcoin and change management, there's a, quite a big hurdle with that when you think about consuming change and you think about what Bitcoin is mm -hmm. because um, you say Bitcoin, it actually means two things, right? It's an open monetary network okay. that anybody can participate in. And then there's Bitcoin, the asset, which is what most people think of the, the coin that is worth about 49,000 per right. one Bitcoin right, right as now. Of, as of today, yes. Yes, Absolutely. as of today. Yeah. We'll see what tomorrow looks yeah. like. But. Um, so are you having companies call you to ask about Bitcoin and how they can get exposed to it? Right now, it's just individuals. Okay. And I've really, it's only a few months old. So, mm -hmm. my courses that I launched are um, focused ma mainly on small group webinars. So, okay. like, no more than five people because it's such a complicated topic. Right. I want to be able to provide an intimate setting where people can learn and ask questions and be comfortable. So, if you're not comfortable, you're probably not learning that well because. I want to build a brain, a brain friendly environment, basically that sure. allows people to learn about it and to also how to manage change when you're adopting Bitcoin, because right. that is so important. Right. So let's get into the Bitcoin thing. Um, 
I guess we can start from the very basic. So what is your take on, like, what is money to you? And then I guess okay. we'll go into Bitcoin. Because mm-hmm. I, I think people are very confused about what money is, actually. So right, yeah, money. Think. So it has three main components. Okay. It is a unit of account, mm-hmm. a medium of exchange, okay. and ideally, it's a store of value. Right. So... When you want to, uh, if we want to compare right now the dollar, which we often think of as money, mm-hmm. but if you look at the de- definition of money, it's more like just currency because money is supposed to be a store of value and it's supposed to be scarce, but the dollar isn't always scarce. Right? Right. We don't even know how how many dollars are out in existence or being borrowed right now. But in Bitcoin, you know that the cap is 21 million Bitcoin and that's it. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how did you get exposed to Bitcoin? What is your journey to understanding it? And... I first learned about Bitcoin in 2012. Okay. And it was actually through the Ron Paul campaign. And somebody was speaking about Bitcoin and sound money because, you know, Ron Paul is very big on sound money, meaning it's um, backed by something. It right. has some kind of soundness that has value aside from just government confidence. Mm-hmm. So that's what a lot of our dollar system is played out on today it's with confidence so but in 2012 when i looked at it I was like wow that's a great idea but we'll see how it goes right right because yeah. it's kind of its status to me was pretty low mm-hmm. so there's this concept in, in neuroscience it's called scarf the scarf model okay it's from dr david rock and neuro leadership it stands for status certainty autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. Okay. So these are things that they're social drivers of behavior, and we're always scanning for them in our environment. We're looking for threats, and we're looking for rewards in them. And if we think that there's going to be reward, we'll go towards it because it's positive. But if we think that there's going to be a threat in one of those areas, we're going to back off Mm -hmm. and, you know, even maybe fight it off depending on what it is. So depending on your personality and if you're trying to manage change, when it comes to Bitcoin, people can assess things like Bitcoin through SCARF. So like I was just saying, the status of Bitcoin for me was pretty low in 2012 because I didn't have any confidence in it yet. I didn't know what it was or I kind of knew what it was, but it sounded just like pie in the sky. Sure. Really. And then as the years came on, it's, it's not even a teenager yet, Bitcoin. It just turned 12 this year. But my status in my mind has gone up so much because my education level has gone up so much about it. And it's, it's been through so much already. So it's reached right. over a trillion dollar market cap within the 12 years. And no company has ever done anything like that right. in that speed right. without PR firm or marketing or you know, a CEO. Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's set the basis level. What is what is Bitcoin to you? And if you could tell us what you mm-hmm. think, if you answer that. Bitcoin is a vote for freedom, in my mind. Okay. It is a peaceful way to interact with people. It is separating state from money. Mm-hmm. So there doesn't have to be any third party in between for me to send you one Bitcoin or any amount. So one Bitcoin can be broken into 100 million Satoshis. So it's very divisible. And you can choose to interact with it or choose not to. So you have the autonomy to engage in it as much as you want or as little as you want. Mm -hmm. So like I said, Bitcoin is an open monetary protocol and it's also an asset that rests on at that 21 million Bitcoin. Okay. So with this open monetary network, it's very similar to the internet, which was an open monetary, or not monetary, it was, it's an open network that anyone can engage in and participate in. Mm-hmm. And that's what Bitcoin is just for finance. So it's totally decentralized in that sense. What do you say to people that say it's, they're worried about how secure it is? Um, can you tell us about the technology that provides that type of security, I guess? Mm-hmm. Um, so the security of Bitcoin is called the hash rate. Okay. And that has only been going up since its inception mm-hmm. 12 years ago. So if you look at the hash rate, it's extremely high compared to when it started. When it started back in 2009, it would have been very easy to hack and take over and, and manipulate. 
But at this point, there's so much competition with the mining that happens. And mm-hmm. the mining is basically the, the act of clearing transactions every 10 minutes and okay. putting them in a block. Uh-huh. So what's called the blockchain, which is entire, the entire ledger of all transactions that have ever happened in Bitcoin. So that's how you know where all the Bitcoin lies, because everybody can see where it's been. You right. can look at this ledger and anybody can go in and say, oh, this is where this Bitcoin or these Satoshis are at this time. So are these miners all verifying that ledger at the same time? They're all competing mm-hmm. to, yes, to verify the transactions. Like if I send one to you, I have to sign something to send it to you. And they're going to look at that transaction and say, is this valid or not? And if okay. it's not, they'll just ignore it. And then I just wasted money because I attached a a fee to send that to you. But if it didn't actually go through, I just kind of lost some money there. And it's because these miners are constantly competing Mm -hmm. to make sure the ledger is secure. That's what's causing it to be so secure, I guess. Right. And it really works off of game theory. So Mm -hmm. it's more beneficial for someone at this point to just participate and try to mine a block Mm -hmm. than to hack the system. Because whenever you successfully mine a block, you get a subsidy for that. So first you get all the fees that people, whenever they sent transactions, attach that. The miner gets that. Mm -hmm. But then they also, at this point, they get 6.25 Bitcoin that is rewarded to that person for securing the network and clearing the transactions. So whenever, and and that subsidy goes down every four years, it's called the halving. And when it started it was 50 blo- or 50 bitcoin mm-hmm. for one block and now it's all the way down to 6.25 and that's built into the programming that's right? all built As in more and more so there's mind. a lot of certainty to it because you have the hash rate that's been increasing this entire time you have blocks that are settled every 10 minutes and the difficulty to settle that block actually adjusts every two weeks so if there's more miners that come onto the network mm-hmm that difficulty is gonna increase. If a lot of miners come offline, let's say like if something happened in a country where they weren't allowed to be there anymore and they mm-hmm. all had to move, it yeah. will drop. So the recent drop with what mm-hmm. happened in China, was that a concern to Bitcoiners because that might affect the hash rate and then the security of it? I don't think people that are highly knowledgeable were as concerned as people that didn't know as much because okay. if you looked at it that yes the hash rate did drop Mm -hmm. but bitcoin didn't miss a beat it didn't stop at all so um that was a really great test too to say hey you can have a ton of miners come offline and it's still going to be secure it's not going to close down bitcoin's open 24 7 so you don't have to to really concern yourself and you can look at all these network activity um, metrics Mm. you can go to Glassnode or other places where you can look and see how all that data is going where Bitcoin is moving how the um, how many addresses are being created and how much is in them so you can look under the hood as much as you want and again that grows that certainty level for people if you can understand that that you have access to that right and as far as anyone knows right now, there hasn't been a hack on the Bitcoin Correct. network. Correct. There has not been a hack okay. on the Bitcoin network, but a lot of people get confused with whenever an exchange or something gets hacked and mm-hmm. then they lose all their Bitcoin. So one thing about Bitcoin is who custodies or holds your Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. You can self-hold it. You can hold it in your own offline wallet or a cold wallet, okay. or you can, if you're maybe you're a trader or you're trying to buy and sell, you can have it what's on an exchange. Right. And if that exchange gets hacked, you might lose your Bitcoin because they're holding your Bitcoin. It's right. almost like if a bank gets hacked and if you had your bank, uh, if you had a bank account there, your money might get hacked or you know. Um, stolen in a sense, but with banks, there's that insurance that's mm-hmm. there, that FDIC. So there's right. a level of comfort for people um, so to hold money to bank. The confusion is they're confusing the the institution getting hacked and Bitcoin being taken as far, but not the network itself being hacked. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow, that's interesting. So when you talk to your clients and they're you know newbies and they're just exploring this new world. How do you, what advice do you give them to get exposed to it, I guess? Well, they really have to hear that wake up call and have an interest in it, right? Because 
you really start to go down a rabbit hole when you start to learn about Bitcoin and you kind of have to gauge what their appetite for that is. Because um, I don't know if you've seen the matrix with the red pill right. and the blue pill. Well, there's the orange pill. So mm-hmm. are you going to take the whole orange pill and really understand, you know, what what is money and then what's happening in our current environment with currency and the basically unlimited printing that's been going on and what that does to your purchasing power in whatever denomination that you're saving in. So right. if it's dollars, your purchasing power is, it, it's literally losing energy and you're trying to contain and store your energy, right? So mm-hmm. I want to make people aware that this type of, this type of thing is happening where you're, you earn money, but that dollar is purchasing you less all the time. Right. So right. trying to get them to see this alarming environment that we're in because there's, I don't have a lot of confidence in the dollar in the long term. It actually just turned 50 this month for being off the gold standard, right. meaning, it, you know, you used to be able to turn in a dollar and get some gold for it. Right. And then when they t- uh, took that apart, it, it really gave government unrestrained credit card. So, so. Would, would Bitcoiners be less likely to be a Bitcoiner if we were still on the gold standard, do you think? Or is it the centralized um, control of it still a problem? At that I point? think there's, there's a lot of manipulation with gold price. Mm-hmm. And I think people see that. But I think a lot of Bitcoiners do like gold still. So, okay. And I think a lot of them came from that gold realm. Mm-hmm. So they could probably be open to both, to both gold and Bitcoin, because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, per sure. se. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, the people that you're talking to, are they getting into Bitcoin because they just want to be speculative and make money? Or do you see more of them wanting to go down the rabbit hole and figure out what exactly is going on in the world and then that's why they're getting bitcoin so what, what are you seeing there i guess i kind of see a bit of both okay so and then sometimes people that are you know they hear about it and they talk about it with me a little bit and mm-hmm. then they'll come back and they'll be even more interested and in really seeing people fired up so that gets me fired up just seeing them excited because then i really see that they're starting to get it because sure. Whenever I hear people say, oh, should I sell it um, at this time or this time? I'm thinking, you, you don't fully understand it yet then mm-hmm. in my mind. But I know a lot of people, they don't want to take the time to get it because it's it's a lot to understand. And you can continue to go down this rabbit hole and still be learning. So right. I, I learn about it all the time still because there's there's just so much development on the, the space and mm-hmm. in the Bitcoin network, there's the Lightning Network, which is a level uh, a layer two that runs on top of Bitcoin, okay. and it's enabling things like faster payments and transactions, cheaper transactions, and reducing congestion. Mm-hmm. So it's solving for problems that um, Bitcoin had to begin with because it's people see it as slow and it's expensive, and they're comparing it to something that's been around for quite some time with our credit cards and and debit cards and things like that. But so on top of this confusion, obviously is the presence of all the other cryptocurrencies out there in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, They're built specifically to kind of solve some of the issues that Bitcoin wasn't necessarily built for. Right. So, you know, you have things like Ethereum, Cardano, they're, Built for transactions, or so they claim, right? Mm-hmm. Um, when you talk to people and they ask you these questions, how do you? Well, first of all, what do you tell them about the other currencies, and then how do you kind of make them understand this whole confusing thing that's out there right now? So. Well, I have to tell them that Bitcoin is different from all of the others, okay. and it is the first one that has ever been. So I kind of see it as like the mitochondrial Eve of. The other currencies, okay. which if you know what that is, that it's, is you know, most a, humans come from this analogy, one yeah. person over sure. in Africa, it's, they think, and right. all of that, right? So Bitcoin brought block, uh, blockchain technology, and that's what then allowed this um, flourishing of other coins that have happened. But mm. what I can say is Bitcoin is the only one that is actually decentralized in the sense of you can't point to someone and say, there's the leader and there's the CEO, Mm -hmm. there's the person that runs this place. Whereas in Ethereum and all of these other ones, there's these forms of centralization where it's truly not completely decentralized. Why why is that bad then? Because it's 
it's subject to trust of other people mm -hmm. and manipulation. Okay. So if we're trying to separate state from money, you don't want to have any single person to be able to manipulate that. Mm -hmm. And people have thought too, oh, Bitcoin's manipulated because of some comments that are made on Twitter, but that also shows you how young Bitcoin is. It's still being monetized. It's you know just reached a trillion. It's a little under a trillion dollars right now, but it has the ability to assume over three hundred trillion dollars worth of value, right. which makes upwards to you know ten, twelve million dollar per one Bitcoin. Right. But that's on a longer time frame, right? Sure. That's on like a ten to twenty year time frame, which maybe isn't really that far, but. It do is you, for some. Do you see a world where Bitcoin can exist as the store of value and then some of these other coins existing as more transaction-focused platforms, I guess? Well, I see all of the other ones as venture capital because mm -hmm. my level of confidence in all of those is nothing like Bitcoin. It's okay. just They're just different animals and they're not money that's for the people and from the people. And Bitcoin is open to the nearly 8 billion people we have on this planet with just a phone. Mm -hmm. And you can't really say that about any of those other coins. And in fact, too, that they have that element of centralization that if a government wanted to go and say, hey, guys, we're going to take you down, right? they're going to go down. That's it. But with Bitcoin, there's no one single person that you can get to. They're all they're nodes in the space or they're miners just mining. And then with the transactions that you were talking about, um, and having those be faster, the Lightning Network is growing super fast and it is solving for those types of issues if you choose to use Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So if you have a life raft, do you um, want a really strong, sturdy raft? Or do you want something that's kind of, mm, you're not really sure of? Or do you want to put some of your family in the one you're not sure of and then yourself in the sturdy one? That's To me, that's like putting Bitcoin and then everything else. Sure. So when it comes to those digital um, coins like right. Ethereum. Okay. Um, so are you saying that if you were, if you had some money to invest in cryptocurrency, you would put most of it in Bitcoin, right? Um, what do you say to those critics that say, um, if the harder it gets to mine, right, you have these large groups of miners taking over the mining process and it becomes centralized to those mining groups? Is that a concern that Bitcoiners should have? There will always be a lot of healthy competition for mining okay. because there's the money that's involved and the game theory that's involved. Mm -hmm. And what's great is you can mine Bitcoin anywhere in the world. So it could be in a volcano somewhere or in the Antarctica somewhere. Mm -hmm. So there's just so much potential for people to interact and to participate in that competition of mining. It would be really difficult to see a space where it's all centralized in one place because it's open to everybody to right. compete with and it would make it wouldn't make sense from a country perspective not to compete in something that's been growing mm -hmm. so so fast and you can use clean energy to mine it right so um cryptocurrency guys have said that the lightning network is run by people who are altruistic right they're not motivated by greed money to to keep that network sound and growing and whereas like an ethereum person would say well i'm doing this for greed right i'm motivated by my own self greed which is part of the free market to make this thing like you said you know, a venture capital project right do you see that as a concern where on the Bitcoin side, it's an open network, so people go there because they want to help out of their own goodwill. But it's not motivated by any, you know, greed that drives mm, capitalism. I don't know because if you have a pretty strong Lightning node, you can mm -hmm. actually get a lot of routing fees for okay. just having it up. Right. It's just a matter of having a good node that's mm -hmm. set up that has channels that with the funding in it to do it. So there's definitely an ability to make um, some money by okay. just having lightning channels. And okay. it's actually a way that you can make more Bitcoin without having to give up your keys, meaning you have the, the keys to send and sign your Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. If you have it in your lightning network or your lightning node, you're able to keep it there and then have routing fees and transactions for having those networks and those channels open amongst other lightning nodes. Okay. Um, 
are you concerned that governments may try to crack down on Bitcoin exchanges? Oh, um, they've been they've been working on it. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> how how do Bitcoiners think about that? Because I don't. Do you see the government backing off ever, and this just becomes part of everyday life one day, or how strong is that resistance going to be? Do you think? I think it's pretty strong from the the people that want to maintain their hold on control of how money works and how it functions and to be be a, a central third person that's in between people with their transactions right, right. so there's always going to be the struggle of people wanting to be uh, in control and people wanting to be free mm -hmm. so i think that will always be there um we're definitely past the you know first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they right. fight you and i think we're in that fighting and winning stage we're in, in those depending on what country you're in or what state you're in so like el salvador they recently made bitcoin legal tender right. which is just wow so explosive and such a such a great thing to see but and then you have china which and then you have china doing it. the opposite right. thing right. yeah um, so where do you see the u.s going i guess you know, it's it, it was cre it was made a property, so it is considered property. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot of legal clarity that can be had for it. Right. And there's, you know, the federal level what they're trying to do and then you have a lot of states too that are starting to become more bitcoin friendly. Like mm -hmm. Wyoming, Texas is a bitcoin friendly state and Florida is a bitcoin friendly state. So I think the more that the federal government tries to regulate it more, I think some states will stand up and say, hey, here's how we're gonna treat Bitcoin, and that's how we're gonna do it. So, but then you're gonna look at Bitcoin and how that's treated, and then how everything else is treating, all of those other currencies that we were talking about, because right. maybe there is security for certain reasons, and that's gonna give, that's gonna give them a, a different category. Do you see a- case something happens, something wrong happening with the cryptocurrency that's not Bitcoin, and then they use that as an excuse to go after Bitcoin. I, can, I could see it, yeah. Right. I mean, but I think you have a growing number of defenders that get Bitcoin, especially in, in Congress, you're starting to see, it's really great to see some people standing up and that understand it and mm -hmm. that can defend it in that way. And the younger generations, we, we're here for Bitcoin and sound money and being able to store your value because the whole world has this issue of securely storing value mm -hmm. and having property rights that can't be taken away from you. Right. I think Bitcoin is the supreme defender of property rights because you can hold it yourself. Mm -hmm. You can walk to another country, you can walk across to another country and you can store it right here and no one can take that from you. Right, right. So, and when you say store it here, you mean in your mind, the key. The key. Yes, yeah, storing right. keys in your right. mind, where you can then go and, and unlock it in a in a wallet that you want to use from. Right. So, right. Um, earlier in the conversation, you mentioned you know state money, so that seems to be a barrier with a lot of people that don't understand cryptocurrency or I mean Bitcoin. Um, there's just this thing with Americans that say, well, money comes from the government. How is that barrier, you think, going to be broken down? Because it doesn't have to be necessarily, at least that's what Bitcoin is saying. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you get past that? Because that's, I think that's ingrained in people. Yeah, and I agree. And it comes back to that massive organizational change of understanding mm -hmm. Bitcoin and going through that change of what money means and what your dollar means and what you've been saving all these years. What does, what's that really mean? And being, are you being beholden to the banks and the dollar and mm -hmm. hoping that it has value later? Or do you want to look at something that you can really have control of fully yourself and is really a fair system. So again, going back to that scarf model, if you look at the assessment of the dollar when it comes to scarf and its status, it's, you know, the value has been going down. It's uncertain. We don't know how much there is of it. Right. We don't really have the autonomy of the dollar is, I mean, you can choose to use it, right? Mm -hmm. But they often tell you what you can use it for and what you can't use it for. Right. Um, 
it doesn't seem fair, at least in my mind, because they can print as much, they can make my dollar worth less and I still have to work for that. Mm -hmm. And that they're taking away people's time because you're, you use money to save your time, right? Right. Can contain your energy for later use. Mm -hmm. But if it's being depleted all the time, you just keep running and running just to stay in place and you're still falling behind because if you're not beating inflation, which last year was 25% inflation, that's how much they printed. Did you get a 25% raise last year and this year? I mean, ooh. So my SCARF assessment of the dollar is is low. Mm -hmm. And if you have a SCARF assessment of Bitcoin, I think the more people... And I know that they don't really think of the scarf model consciously, but we're having we're having those thoughts and the going towards and away it. But when you see your assessment of the scarf for the dollar go down and the assessment go up for Bitcoin, you start to see more of that transformation because right. Bitcoin is extremely fair. It is, like I said, anyone can participate in it. And when it started, anyone could mine Bitcoin and earn Bitcoin and there's no leader in that sense. The person that created it, they never monetized the the Bitcoin that they mined. It's still sitting in those addresses. You mm-hmm. can see it. So they just clearly just wanted something that was going to be promoted into the world that could stand to challenge the fiat system or the by decree system that we have for, from government. Right, right. Um, where do you see Bitcoin in five years then? You think it's well the hash rate or the what, what the the price? Do you or? think it's going to be more accepted? Um, do you think it's going to disrupt the financial world? Oh uh, yeah, I think it's already disrupting that, and okay. I see that in the number of changes and adoption. So one of the largest mortgage lenders mm-hmm. is going to be accepting Bitcoin. They're targeting for this year w- to be able one? to do that. Do, uh, um, I just saw the the article. So they they have plans to do this. Yeah, okay. they have plans to do this. Mm-hmm. They're in their recent earnings report. They mentioned they're working to add the ability to accept Bitcoin, mm-hmm. and but just because they want to accept it, I wouldn't necessarily promote people use their Bitcoin to buy, um, get, you know, get a mortgage just because right. that could be a taxable event. So you want to look at the taxable events that you have when you're using Bitcoin in some way. If you're just buying and holding it, there is no taxable event. Right, right. And then you can you can make it so that you never have to sell your Bitcoin. You can use it for, um, you can take out a loan against it. Mm-hmm. And then as the price appreciates over time, you can just use a little bit to pay it off when it's, um, the, if the dollar has depreciated enough. Okay, and there's so, services that do this. Yes, okay. and there's a growing number of services that do this, and okay. ones too that they either hold the keys, or you hold your keys, or maybe it's multiple keys, so there's multi-signature wallets where basically, let's say we have a wallet, um, it could be where I have to sign the transaction, and you have to sign the transaction mm-hmm. for it to go. So it's like an escrow account, basically. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, why do you think people don't understand that their money gets devalued every year because of inflation. It just seems to be an accepted thing. Like, oh, it's just inflation. I know, it's just yeah. inflation, no yeah. big deal. Um, right. we're, we I, just, it's just part of life, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just part of life. Like, But if ever. I took your money from your bank and you had less of that in that amount, you'd be outraged, right? But I'd hope. What is it that you think people don't realize or why don't they care, you think? I don't, it's easy to be jaded, right? And mm-hmm. say, oh, it just went up a little bit. And it's kind of insidious. It, it creeps in over time. Mm-hmm. And I don't think people really know what they could do about it. Like they think, oh, well, it's happening, but I don't know what I'm going to do about that, right. right? So I'm just going to keep on keeping on because that's what I do. Right. And I don't really get this Bitcoin thing. It just looks scary. And everything I hear in the news is, is typically bad, so I'm not going to go there. Right. So... Do you think companies are adopting it faster because they have more money? Like, so if I have $100 million in the bank and inflation is 25%, I just lost $25 million, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas if I'm an individual and I have $1,000 in the bank and I've lost, you know, what, $250, it doesn't mm-hmm. seem as bad over time. But do you think this is why companies are starting to get notice of it? They just want I something I think that, to along with 
as more legal clarity Mm -hmm. comes to it because people or businesses, they don't want to just jump into something that might bite them later because they didn't really understand what they were getting themselves into. So I think if they, they they're cautiously optimistic and approaching adopting Bitcoin, Mm -hmm. that's kind of where a lot of people or a lot of companies are at this point. I see. Okay. So I think you've given us a lot of good information today. Um, I'm going to, turn this over to you if someone approaches you and says i'm thinking about getting exposed to bitcoin um tell us what your advice would be for them where they can go to get information how they can purchase some all that stuff so Mm -hmm. yeah well depending on their level of appetite i would definitely say you know it's a worthwhile journey to continue learning as much about it as you can Mm -hmm. and one of the cheapest ways to purchase it at least at market price is through strike okay. it's an application that they, so they're actually the company that helped bring el salvador to making bitcoin legal tender okay. but they are by far the cheapest in prices to be able to convert dollars or another currency to bitcoin okay. and it's very quick and you can send it to yourself um, you can actually pay yourself in bitcoin and go right to a wallet mm-hmm. Um, but that's if you wanted to pay market price. There's a lot of volatility with Bitcoin, right? So right. some people say, when do I get in or when yeah, do I how, get in? <laughs> how do people, how do you tell people to, to grasp that? Because, you know, it, it can go up and down 20, 30% in a week, right? And that's right. very unstabling for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd want to understand their time frame. So mm-hmm. are you planning to buy Bitcoin and then sell it next week? I, w- I wouldn't buy Bitcoin then. Okay. Right. <laughs> you're going to do that. Okay. If you have more of a, I'm going to buy it and, and hold it for at least two to five years, that mm-hmm. would be better. I would still think even longer because it's going to become, it's going to continue to be monetized for a number of years until it really settles into a price that it slows down because it, again, it's only, it's under $1 trillion in market cap. And right. you know, you look at the infrastructure bill, they, how much did they just <laughs> right. So right. Uh, it's just, it's such an infant at this point. Mm-hmm. So I would definitely recommend people to buy and not sell it. But, okay. um, you know, you can't control people's behavior. You can only say, well, here's why I wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Try to give them the most um, relevant options for that person, for that place. Because I'm not a financial advisor. I can't give financial advice, but I can help educate them so that they can make educated de- decisions and be confident in earning Bitcoin or buying, you can even earn it through uh, spending. So there's different debit cards and rewards cards. So you can do it without having to physically just go and transfer or convert um, dollars. You can just use it through your normal spending as Mm -hmm. well. So when you talk to people nowadays about Bitcoin, do they believe you when you tell them about the way money is printed and governed right now? Or is it just, oh, you you guys are just, you know, it, Bitcoin is nothing. It's just a fad for now. Are you seeing that? or? Um, I'm seeing more and more people come back to me and say, hey, I, I'm starting to see this more because they're mm-hmm. seeing the prices go up in right. terms of dollars. And then I say, well, it's going down in Bitcoin price. Right. <laughs> You're going down in the amount of Satoshis. So um, it really depends on that person's journey and their interest because if they're not really concerned about money they're not going to care too much about bitcoin or if they're very comfortable because like we are a highly banked society in the united states versus if you go over to africa or someplace that they don't have banks Mm -hmm. they'd be very interested in bitcoin because they only need a cell phone to participate in it and to send send some value over to one of their friends without paying all of these crazy remittance fees right so Well, Angela, I think we'll end there. Um, thank you so much for this. Uh, we'd really like to have you back one day. Um, tell us more about your agency, how it's grown, and then all the, the new folks that you've reached out to and kind of introduced Bitcoin to. So, But thank you very much for coming all today. All right. Thank you for having me. Sure. Yeah.